The Bounty Hunters The first round only has about four points with a direct tie between Cindy and the house. She declines a double or nothing wager against the house, and the pot remains untouched for the next round. Something she had forgotten to mention is that in Casino's ties, ended up with this double or nothing wagers between the winners, rather than splitting the pot between the winners. Why didn't you challenge them? You could win, he had whispered to her as he kisses the side of her cheek. Ties in these rounds against the house default to the house. Odds are slightly in their favor, she answered. That had made a lot of sense, putting everything even more in the house's favor. Not only did you buy into the game where the house had a decent chance of winning at little to no cost to the house, but they had a better than average game of winning it straight up, which is quite a bit even if you don't even consider how good or bad a player the dealer is and the odds that the game is even more crooked than normal. A good money-making scheme, little risk, large reward, and enough appeal to keep people coming. In other words, typical casino entertainment. Drinks are brought to keep them playing, as the pot is won and used to buy back into the next round and the money keeps moving. The drinks are tiny little fruity flutes of some kind of berry wine that's more like a child's watered-down drink than a proper bit of booze. Gregory can barely taste the alcohol. Pukey is mentally scanning the glasses of the others for the residue. A bit of backwash is in one of them, but nothing else. The drinks were clean. As Gregory gets more and more comfortable until he outright shifts things so that Cindy is sitting on his lap as a playful distraction to her opponents and an excuse to be closer to her, Pukey, on the other hand, is getting more and more paranoid. He knows he's being watched and that the ultimate authority behind it is a potential danger. He doesn't know much about the owners except that they have their fingers in a lot of pies. No racial information, no psychological profile, no nothing, meaning there's a non-zero chance that something he does might send them into a murderous rage. But suspicion is just suspicion, reason to be ready and nothing else. So I have to ask, the Tret player begins as she eyes up Cindy and Gregory with some jealousy. How did you two meet? It's not often that you see a Tret with the more lacking races. Lacking? Gregory asks, even as he places a hand on Cindy in case one of them grows upset. In height, I understand if some things might seem cute with such a small lady, but she trails off as Pukey comes to the fore and she finds herself preaching to a man with death in his eyes. Please no intimidating other guests, Captain Schmidt, the dealer states calmly. Pukey relaxes and sinks under Gregory again, who gives a dopey smile. Sorry about that. Me and Cindy have been through a lot together. I don't like people being rude to her. Gregory apologizes. We're aware. Don't worry. You're customers. Until you're not, of course. The dealer remarks. We don't want a repeat of what happened in the Gilded Goal. We don't deal with those sorts of things. You know what happened? Pukey asks as the Gregory coat is completely set aside. The muscles in his legs tense as he readies to use the table first as a bludgeon, then as cover before becoming a bludgeon again. Furniture is versatile that way. Yes, my employers are telling me even now to play nice as the last time someone played nasty with you in a casino you escaped. Went on a rampage, seduced the staff, set the place on fire, and stole enough assets to start an independent business the dealer says as she shuffles the cards flawlessly. I've also been told that on this station you've never once started the fight, meaning that you're in for a long, boring evening as I'm being threatened with a firing if I start a fight with you. You must be joking, I mean sure, he's lean and sweet looking, but beyond that glare, I doubt he's a danger to anyone. The Nagasha remarks and the dealer titters in amusement. Oh, he may look adorable but he's a hunter. No doubt you've already planned innumerable ways to deal with us all. The dealer asks, and Pukey raises an eyebrow. For the sake of keeping things peaceful and fun, I decline to answer that question. Pukey remarks before suddenly grinning and changing back into Gregory. But if you want our plans, 
It's to have my little Cindy eat all the food she likes to eat, have the fun she likes to have. Then when we go back to our home, we'll try to find an answer to the question of how much sex is too much. Making them jealous is bad sport, darling. Just let me play. I don't need help. Cindy says sweetly, knowing that her being magnanimous about this is just an extra little twist of the knife. My, my, what a wonderful little relation. Is there room for more? The Nagasha asks, and Cindy titters into her gloved hand. I'm afraid we move around quite a bit. Our time here on the station is temporary, while there is plenty of room on the chain breaker. It's not a life for the faint-hearted or frail, Cindy remarks. The boys on that ship play hard and rough in the worst kinds of places, not to mention they get into all sorts of strange moods at random. He's twice my size but is living big enough to make a littus look puny. You make it sound like hunting dangerous beasts large enough to crush an air car in their maws is strange, Gregory muses with a happy little grin as he can all but hear the blasts of the pop guns. That was a good hunt. It is, Cindy protests. Fun, though, he remarks as he considers that there's still a lot of frozen carnex meat. Actually, now that he considers it, no one said exactly what kind of meat the meatloaf would be made out of. He wouldn't put it past any of the guys, including himself, to not grind up the carnex and use it for the loaf. See what I mean? Trying to keep up with that kind of high-caliber crazy is exhausting, Cindy remarks. Large beasts? The dealer asks. Carnex, fairly harmless if they're a few hundred kilometers away from the nearest person. Otherwise, they need to be taken care of and quickly, Gregory explains as the cards are dealt out for the next round. You forgot to mention that a full-grown Carnex is so powerful that it requires ship-grade weaponry to kill them. You made custom kinetic cannons to deal with them, and it still took two shots per Carnex, Cindy reminds him. Yes, well, there's no point to worry the table. I don't want to be too distracting, Gregory teases, and there's some giggling from Cindy as she looks over her cards. A five and a twenty. The goals are seven, 19, and a 24. The cards placed upwards are a 2, a 13, a 30, a 4, and a 12. They're only allowed to take from the center in clockwise order, and when the Nagasha doesn't take the 19 and instead takes the 2, Cindy grabs it for two easy points to herself and denying a point each to all of her opponents. There are heavy footsteps behind them, and Gregory turns to see a Morega with a dark blue pelt in a shimmering black gown walking in. Seeing a quadruped wearing the equivalent of a cocktail dress is nothing short of bizarre. He turns away and once again starts scanning the room. He can easily hear the loud clopping gait of the hoofed woman. Behind the Morega, a crowd starts filtering in, leading it to a slight war between the relaxed Gregory and Pukey, who wants to give each one a solid scan with his cybernetic eye. Cindy now has a 5, a 20, a 19, a 4, and a 10. The table has a pair of 2s, a 10, a 30, and a 20. She takes one of the 2s. Hey, is that? Someone mutters behind him, and he glances over to see nothing in the crowd. Yes, he's garnering a lot of attention, but there's no one in particular that is staring any more intently than the others. Ha! Huh? Cindy exclaims in glee as she reveals all her cards. The old 20 is gone to be replaced by one of another suit. The other players bow out and the dealer nods. Woohoo! Mama's buying a big one tonight. Does that mean we're taking a break for dinner? Gregory asks, and she nods. Oh yes, bitra tails with cream sauce with an entire platter of thigh and leaf salad. Cindy cheers. Don't let me hold you up the dealer says with a smile. The casino restaurant is straight that way, past the bar and with a wonderful full wall view of the nearby nebula. Enjoy. Very well, if you'll be ready to... Gregory begins, before movement triggers his nerves and he lashes out to boot someone that had been slowly starting to pull away their briefcase. The air distorts and Pukey doesn't even let the cloak in rest for a moment as he grabs them by the head feathers. 
A painful twist and the more common Cloken's concentration is broken and she stops matching the background around her. Security runs up and turns on their shock staffs to hold at her neck. After a moment, Pukey lets go and steps back and puts Cindy down gently before scratching the back of his neck. Sorry, my dear. I was caught up in punishing the fool that I got carried away carrying you. Oh, I don't mind. Being close to the action every now and again is exciting, Cindy remarks as she quickly steps beside the briefcase and puts a hand on it. How did you see her? She was effectively invisible, the Nagasha asks and Pukey shrugs. My kind are keyed in to detect movement. She got far too close for me to not notice. He somewhat lies. The movement had been mostly in the axiom, but he had moved too fast to fully process what kind of movement he was detecting, something he'll have to get under control before it gets him or his men hurt. He picks up the briefcase and adds their winnings to the section designed to carry it already. It had only been partially filled after all. Why do you have a plasma sword and a custom banger in your briefcase? The dealer asks, now that she can see into it as they load it up. We just had a spot of trouble. The undaunted such as I believe it's best to be over-prepared than under-prepared. Gregory says pleasantly as he slots in all the coins into the rows and then clips the case shut. Should things go the way I want them to, then these are nothing more than unusual decorations inside the case, perhaps a talking point and nothing more. I'd like it to stay that way, but that doesn't mean that if things change for the worse that I'll be caught unprepared. A fair... The dealer pauses and puts a hand to a device hidden in one of her ears. The girls in security want to know if that's the same plasma sword that first took your arm off, then you used to carve your way out of the gilded goal. I consider it lucky, Pukey replies with a truly vicious smile. Then his features soften into Gregory again and he bends down to kiss Cindy on the top of the head. After all, it helped introduce me to Cindy. Your arm is a prosthetic? The Nagasha asks and Gregory pulls off the glove that's hiding his hard, light limb. All the way up to the shoulder, he says as he snaps the briefcase shut. Why haven't you gone through a healing coma or gotten a cloned replacement? Two reasons, one practical the other. Not so much, he admits. Well, don't keep us in suspense, sir, the dealer orders with a smile. It's very practical with using cannons. It's also one of the first gifts from my Cindy. Now, if you'll excuse me, my little lady looks hungry. Gregory answers before offering his hand to Cindy, and she tugs him through the casino with a dopey smile on her face. Soon enough, they have a booth near a corner and are quickly brought a large platter of a dozen crustacean tails with a bowl of creamy sauce in the center of them all. Soon enough, Cindy is all but purring at the creamy, smooth taste that the cream adds to the wonderful texture of the tails. Gregory eats slowly, both to let her have the lion's share of the food, but to also figure out what he could from it. The taste had been boiled out of the tails despite the texture being all right. The creamy sauce was all right. It was certainly creamy, but it lacked a sense of body to it. Such was the issue with alien fare. Still, it made Cindy happy and that was more important to him. 